Dr. Timothy May, I'm the head of the History Department. It's my pleasure to introduce one of the most world-renowned historians, uh, Professor Jeremy Black from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Now, he is the author of, well, at least 102 books. He probably has about 105 by the time I finish this. <laughs> he is that prolific. I know I've seen manuscript after manuscript come into my email box, and it's just astounding the rate of, um, well, publishing. And at the same time, he is not just a person who teaches one class, he teaches a uh, load similar to your faculty in here. So the fact that he does this is astounding at any level. And his work is actually quite good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so he is someone who should be quite memorable. I've heard him talk before a few years ago here. This is the second time here, and I hope that you will find quite Riveting and interesting. So, no further ado, Professor Black. Thank you. I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes on Bond. Uh, I'm going to leave time for <coughs> questions at the end. So, given that it's a rather large group, I hope you don't mind if we don't take questions as we're going along. It'd be quite difficult to keep an eye on everybody. And what I want to do is to talk first of all about the novels, then about the films. And I make that point because uh, it's terribly easy to forget that Ian Fleming, who wrote James Bond, uh, the, the novels, it, it was really a novelist. And what one's got in looking at both the novels and then the films is an opportunity to take a character out of popular fiction, popular mythology, and I hope I'm not upsetting anybody here to say that there is no real James Bond, to take a figure out of fiction and to show how a character who was first launched on the world in 1953, which is when the first novel, Casino Royale, was published, how a character um, of now running for nearly, um, will be nearly 70 years now, uh, nearly 60 years, sorry, how a character of that type can be used to chart changing anxieties, changing cultural tropes. And that indeed is the importance of James Bond for the historian that you can use this character in order to study change. And for us, you know, as historians, we're interested in change. So I'm going to start with the Bond of the 1950s. And in doing so, I'm asking you um, to, as it were, put aside your memories of the films. <coughs> All right? I know that's going to be quite difficult, but bear in mind, James Bond was invented as a fictional character to work in the book-reading public of the 1950s. And he worked because he, as it were, featured in, focused on anxieties and interests of the 1950s. So Fleming first. Ian Fleming, born 1908, very wealthy banking family. His father is a member of parliament, volunteers to serve in the First World War and gets killed on the Western Front. Fleming inherits a lot of money. Um, drifts around in the interwar years, the 1920s and 30s, not really focusing on anything as a career. He has, his, he has a hand, tries to go into the army, but he doesn't really find it easy to accept the discipline of having to do things like get up in the morning. He tries, to, he tries his hand at the city, the British equivalent of Wall Street, same problem. Tries his hand at journalism, which he finds quite interesting. And whilst... Um, a journalist, he's sent to cover a series of spy trials in Moscow, trials of British engineers, and it may be that during that period he has links uh, with British intelligence. Like many people of his generation, both British and American, the same thing happened here, he had what is known as a good war, or the war made him. You've got to bear in mind, just as the war uh, for many people causes terrible hardship, suffering, loss, and all the rest of it, for other people it gives them tremendous opportunities. He had a good war. First of all, he discovered something he really liked doing, and second of all, he was pretty good at it. Uh, he becomes the assistant to the head of naval intelligence, and in that role plays a part in helping to plan special operations uh, linked to the Navy. And he enjoys that, he becomes very interested in espionage, and he makes a lot of very good connections. And at the end of the war, uh, he becomes a senior journalist. He becomes the head uh, for the Sunday Times, which is one of the leading British Sunday newspapers, of their foreign journalists, the, the um, executive responsible for them. And that is a period when the British Secret Service, the external secret service, essentially 
has two secret services, the Internal Secret Service, MI5, which deals with counter-terrorism uh, and counter-subversion within Britain, and the External Secret Service, MI6, or otherwise known as the Secret Intelligence Service, which deals with external um, intelligence. And he became, um, at that stage, the British used um, the foreign correspondence system as cover for some of their agents sometimes with hilariously bad effects. I mean, the most famous British spy, in the sense that he was a Soviet, he was really a Soviet agent of that period, Kim Bilby, ends up as the economist's man in Beirut before defecting. Anyway, Fleming therefore keeps up his knowledge of what is known as tradecraft, understanding what is really going on in intelligence and how it's done, and the particular skills and techniques. And he also takes a special interest in the development of Interpol. Um, so he has links with intelligence. The late 40s, he's a rich man, he's inherited a lot of money, but the late 40s, Britain has a phenomenally high-taxing Labour government. Very, you know, very socialist, nationalises a lot, very high rate of taxation, in particular on dividends, maximum tax rate of 98%, really, in a sense, confiscatory. And for somebody like Fleming, who essentially is living on inherited uh, earnings, this is really difficult. And he sets out to invent James Bond as a character to make money. Nothing wrong with that. Money, the, one of the difficulties, one of the interesting things where if you do literature courses, some of you may be literature majors, is on the whole, people who do literature courses tend to think of the author as a kind of romantic capital R character who sort of communes with his or her inner sensibility. Rubbish. Most authors in world history have done it in order to make money. Um, and Fleming is no exception, uh, particularly in popular forms of literature. Fleming is no exception. And he's got a particularly expensive life at that period because um, he takes up with the wife of a leading press baron um, and she moves from being his mistress, which is quite cheap because her husband pays for her, to being his wife, which is a real disaster because she's very expensive. And he's ending up with paying for three houses, a large house in the centre of London, a house in the countryside, a house in Jamaica. And he can't afford that on his income and his investments, so he sets out to write. And he invents a secret agent because at that period, um, there is a very strong, as it were, tradition of a sort of paranoid sensibility, a sense of, pa of fear and anxiety, which a number of writers have tapped from the 1900s onwards, with enormous profitable success. Um, it's rather interesting that Britain, which was you know, one of the world's major powers at that period, it had been the world's leading empire until uh, World War II, uh, and even after it gives away India, independence to India is 1947, but you know, it's still a leading, a leading empire, leading power, even if it's in relative decline. The sense that there are secret <coughs> conspiracies against Britain the sense that the empire is under threat from sinister foreigners is very much part of a genre of British literature. The first great writer in that was a chap called, his real name was Patrick Sarsfield, he was a journalist, but he wrote uh, under a pseudonym of Sax Roma, and he invented a character called Fu Manchu. I invented him before the First World War, and Fu Manchu was a mysterious Chinaman based in the London docks, where well, on earth he should want to be based there is another question, we've never been to the London docks, we've never been back to one side, and from sinister lairs in places like Limehouse, he would have planned conspiracies to bring down the empire, and always, you know, gets away at the last minute uh, as, the, as the goodies bring him down, and then he gets, survives to fight another turn. When I was young, um, I can remember Fu Manchu films regularly showing as B-movies uh, in the cinema um, at that period, and always, you know, heroes like Sexton Blake were just about to kill him at the end of a story, and he sort of gets away, and then you know he's going to be back next year on another Fu Manchu adventure. And Fleming himself admitted that Fu Manchu was one of the great influences on him. After the First World War, there was again another series of these kind of paranoid novels about great anxiety. Uh, there were the novels of Sapper, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, McNeil, all about, again, a hero called Sapper who's saving the empire against sinister foreigners. Uh, and many of these novels were, were, uh, were full of racial prejudice, of class, uh, anger and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of, a lot of, lot combines on this, uh, on this culture of paranoia. Um, John Buckham uh, wrote a number of novels, including The Three Hostages, on the same theme, the idea of the traitor within who's trying to bring down the empire. 
And one of the most interesting ones, for those of you who like detective novels, I'm very much a fan of detective novels, is one that's never yet been filmed, which is Agatha Christie's uh, uh, effort at this, The Big Four. Um, the, uh, with the plot, again, is quite interesting, because in some respects you can see where Fleming is coming from. At the beginning of The Big Four, Hercule Poirot and his sidekick, Captain Hastings, are walking around Paris. They survive an attempt to murder them, to corrupt them, which was the favourite way of killing people in Paris in the 1920s. Um, and they go back to their hotel, and Poirot explains to Hastings how, quote, behind everything, quote, behind Bolshevism, in other words, what we would call communism, there is a secret conspiracy, and this secret conspiracy is the Big Four. And the Big Four press a lot of anxiety buttons. Number four is a British assassin, number three is an American plutocrat, uh, number two is a French female scientist, all sorts of problems there. Number one is a mysterious Chinaman, again, a kind of Fu Manchu figure, trying to bring down the empire, and Poirot and Hastings track down to these, these people to a lair underneath a Swiss mountain in an episode straight out of what would be James Bond, and bring down this conspiracy. So in other words, in many senses, Fleming is buying into and developing an existing literature. But what he does is to take it further. He brings it up to date for the 1950s. Now, it may be rather difficult to think of these terms because you read a 1950s novel now and you think how dated it is, and there's much about Fleming's novels that aren't very pleasant, and maybe somebody will ask me about that in the questions. But in, the in, in its times, these were really quite radical novels. First thing that was very not radical, that really attracted a lot of readers without a doubt, was the issue of women and sex. Uh, the traditional adventure story novel, women didn't really play a role. They were there in order to be captured by the villain and the equivalent of tied to the railway tracks and the, and the um, hero comes and rescues them. All right? uh, or um, the hero might, in the end, marry one, but she ends up like Richard Panny's wife, who essentially uh, likes going shooting and, hus and hunting with her husband, and is really an honorary man. You know, these are really totally sexless novels, and the women are very anodyne characters. Well, you wouldn't say that of the Fleming novels. First of all, the women are quite unusual by any stretches of the imagination for the 1950s figures. None of these women, bar one, Tracy, who marries him in on Her Majesty's Secret Service and then gets murdered on her wedding day, which is not much of an advert for being married to James Bond, none of the women, bar her, are interested in matrimonial motherhood. The women themselves are quite modern figures. They don't want to get married, quite happy to have sex, but they don't want to get married, and they don't want to have children. So for the 1950s, that's quite a modern, uh, it was what they called the new woman in that period. Uh, secondly, many of the women themselves are rather interesting in their backgrounds. Take the ludicrously named Pussy Galore. You may think of Pussy Galore from the film. If you read the novel, she is head of the Cement Breakers. The Cement Breakers is a New York lesbian motorcycle gang. Now, for most readers, both British and American, of novels in the 1950s, that is not a role they would have been used to seeing a female in an adventure story. And so they've got quite sort of unusual characters introduced. And lastly, Fleming, although himself a very unpleasant man, quite a sexist, racist, and quite unpleasant, did seem to have an ability to get into some aspects of the female psyche. One of his best novels is The Spy Who Loved Me. And the unusual thing about that novel, that you will know if you've read it, is it's written from the woman's point of view. It's actually a narrative, and it's an adventure story turned from the perspective of the woman. James Bond only turns up half the way through. It's mostly about her relations with men before that, and the men all appear as uniform and <coughs> awful. It's very much written from a, from a woman's point of view. And it's a very accomplished piece of writing, and that in part is one of Fleming's skills. He actually could write. Uh, does anybody know, actually, um, of probably his most sort of singularly commercially successful book? Does anybody know? It's not, a, it's not an adventure hero story. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yes, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He wrote, a, you know, I mean, he had the range to be able to write very good literature for children. He could write very good travel literature. You know, an unpleasant man, but he could actually write. So, first of all, the women makes a big splash in the stories. Second of all, the trade craft. Fleming prides himself on getting it right. Um, 
down to the fact that in the novel uh, from Russia with Love, they start off with a discussion at a meeting of um, uh, KGB agents, um, uh, they call them Smirsch, but they're KGB agents, uh, discussing how to bring down the British Secret Service. And Fleming's actually using real, live, named agents in the discussion. Just as, for example, his, the female agent, the killer, in, um, uh, in From Russia With Love, is a real life, and she's given the name of a real life KGB female colonel in, 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 in Soviet intelligence. So he prides himself on getting his tradecraft right. Um, it, for example, in the very first novel, Casino Royale, the Soviet use of Bulgarians as assassins and how they set out to kill people is based on what the Soviets were doing at that time. And of course, that makes them much more interesting to readers. This is a sense of the real world just there. And indeed, the very first novel is based on a not too ridiculous plot. The very first plot, Casino Royale, is based upon an attempt to undermine the leading communist trade union in France because of the idea being that if World War III breaks out, the Soviets are going to use the communist trade unions in order to have strikes that will stop the use of the railway system and therefore stop the movement of NATO forces. Well, actually, that's not too different from what Bill Donovan, the, uh, the OSS head, the predecessor of the CIA, was trying to do in 1946 and 1947 to overthrow communist trade unions in France and, and Italy. So there's a certain amount of accuracy there, particularly in the early novels, that appeal quite significantly to readers. Next point is that in the early 50s, Britain is still in austerity. There have been a lot of rationing during the war, to, and the British economy after the war that takes a long time to recover, and one of the ways they try and ease recovery is by focusing consumption or the resources of society on the productive area, on industry, and they cut down on people's ability to consume. So things like clothes, food, petrol are all rationed. Fuel is rationed. And in a way, the James Bond novels fulfill a desire for escapism. They're both accurate about the world of intelligence, or reasonably accurate, and fulfill a desire for escapism for a country which is cold, miserable, uh, and quite low in morale. Uh, so that is very good. And of course, this escapism has taken the stage further because James Bond actually goes to rather interesting places. I mean, the very first novel is set in a place called Royale, Casino Royale. There is no such place as Royale, but it's a cross between Le Touquet and Derville, uh, which are casino towns, uh, luxury casino towns on the French Channel coast. And it starts off with a description of what a casino is like at three o'clock in the morning. Now, most of their readers had never been in a casino at three o'clock in the morning. It's an introduction to a world of luxury, or the louche luxury, um, which is fascinating because of its difference. I mean, he includes episodes uh, in that novel, like what it's like to go and eat at a luxury restaurant. And he describes it, James Bond takes his girlfriend out to, would be girlfriend, out to dinner and, you know, orders pâté de foie gras and describes it and all the rest of it. Most readers at that stage had never done anything like that. Most British people in 1953 had not eaten at a quality restaurant. They might have eaten at a Lyons Corner House and the equivalent of McDonald's, but they wouldn't have ever eaten at a luxury restaurant. And there is an air of escapism and the vicarious enjoyment of pleasures that you can't actually uh, have, like the character in the Chandler novel who asks Philip Marlowe to smoke and drink because he can no longer smoke and drink. There's that kind of element in it that, uh, that, uh, that encourages the readers. The same thing in the second novel. The second novel describes arriving in New York City by air um, in 1954. Well, commercial air services across the Atlantic only began in 1946. Their cost was extraordinarily high. This is before the age of wide-bodied jets. So jet travel is extraordinarily expensive. Most people have never been to New York. They've never flown the Atlantic. This is quite astonishing. So again, one of the interests of the, of the, of the plots is the introduction of readers to a world they really don't know about. Um, so that starts off. Casino Royale begins. It sells very well. It's in fact helped by the fact 
that there is austerity in Britain because because of the rationing of paper, there's only a certain number of books, new books, being published each year, which means that if you're one of those new books, you have a chance to have an impact on the market that is much greater than would be the situation, potentially much greater than the situation today. The novels work, 